speak and may we listen in the name of God, who is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Jesus said, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. I like to imagine that Peter might have chipped in at this point. Seriously, Jesus, I have a wife and a mother-in-law at home, a boat sitting idle. Even if I'm not worrying, I can assure you that they are. There is no record of Peter interjecting, but those of us prone to worry will know that being told not to worry is not helpful. And that is one of the problems of taking scripture out of context. There is more going on in this extract from Jesus' teaching than we might realise. Our Gospel is part of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is pointing the attention of those listening to the natural world, the birds of the air and the lilies of the field, held in God's loving care. But we know that the lilies of the field and the birds of the air do struggle. 97% of Britain's wildflower meadows have been lost since the Second World War. This week, the United States Fish and Wildlife Service declared 23 species extinct, including 11 birds, among them the ivory-billed woodpecker. It is a striking bird, or rather it was, black with white markings over the neck and sides, white wing feathers, and a red and black crest. The world is so very much poorer without it. And behind this loss is human action. The climate crisis is causing young people around the world worry. Climate anxiety is a recognised condition, described as a chronic fear of environmental doom, and as a recent psychological disorder affecting an increasing number of individuals who worry about the environmental crisis. Research shows that four in ten young people are reluctant to have children, Three quarters of them find the future frightening, and more than half believe that humanity is doomed. Yet we have known about the climate crisis for some time. The first book outlining the threat of climate change produced for a lay audience came out in 1989. And I am aware that none of this sounds like good news for a Harvest Festival Sunday. Part of the difficulty is psychological. Climate breakdown is such an overwhelming threat that we have trouble processing it. It is hard to find a way of framing it that makes a positive outcome likely, and so it is easier to avoid thinking about it. Our short political cycle doesn't help. Politicians focus on the next election, a few years away, and so the challenging conversations about our need to change are pushed down the agenda. So when these words of Jesus come crashing against the reality of our world, how do we engage with them? This passage is set within a wider collection of teachings about the right use of money. It is a poetic commentary on words about treasures, generosity, and the impossibility of serving both God and wealth. They are addressed to rich and poor alike. In his call to attend to the beauty and the wonder of the world, Jesus is directing us to reflect on God's providential care. I don't need to invite you to look at the earth rotating above us. Gaia draws the eye. 
Someone arriving at the launch event said that they had prepared themselves to be underwhelmed. Even having seen the technical drawings, I was unprepared for the sheer wonder of seeing our home represented this way. Remember, this is a very recent way of seeing the earth. For as long as human beings have lived, we have gazed at the moon, wondering, dreaming, seeking inspiration. It was only with the NASA Apollo 17 mission in 1972 that we were first able to see the Earth as she appears from space, a small blue marble, precious and fragile, floating in the infinite blackness of space. There is so much to notice. The immenseness of the oceans, the sheer size of Africa and Australia. Many maps distort scale, showing the northern hemisphere as larger than the southern hemisphere. There is something else striking too. Look at Africa, South America. There are no borders, no boundaries defining territories. We see one world, a single planet gifted to us by the goodness and grace of God, with resources enough to sustain us and allow for our flourishing. If only we could learn to live sustainably and responsibly. Having been called to bear God's image in the world and exercise the loving, compassionate stewardship of God, we have instead exalted in our own inventiveness and allowed our technologies and economics to take center stage in our lives, displacing God and interfering with God's care for creation. Many of us hearing these words telling us not to worry about food and clothing do not have to choose between heating and eating do not need to use the food bank to supplement a less than living wage. Do not have to keep children from school because we cannot afford to pay the fees. For those of us living in a position of relative affluence, these words of Jesus call us to use the resources at our disposal to work towards redressing the inequalities that leads so many to live in poverty. This means not just praying for leaders and those in authority, as our first reading urges, but holding them to account for their actions, making them aware of our concerns. Many fine words are spoken about addressing climate change that are not backed up by action. This year, our Harvest Appeal is in support of Christian Aid and their work in Malawi. Malawi's contribution to global carbon emissions is negligible. Yet people are struggling because of the climate crisis. Extreme weather is affecting crops. Cyclones have destroyed homes. Floods have washed away livestock. They are being pushed deeper into poverty. Yet change is possible. This is Janet's story. Janet talks of the love, friendship and sense of community she felt when she joined the Mokende Women's Group, a local cooperative of female entrepreneurs. I gave birth to my third child just after joining the group. The group showered me and my baby with gifts, which was the first time I had experienced that since I got married. This was the turning around of my story. The women in the group are transforming their lives through an innovative, sustainable baobab juice making business. Supported by Christian Aid's partner, Eagles Relief and Development, 
The women received training, equipment and a low-cost loan to set up and grow their business. They make up to 6,000 bottles of Baobab juice a month and have increased their income tenfold. 188 jobs have been created through the women's enterprises. As more women join, they learn valuable skills from other members, improving the lives of more women. Women like Janet are changing the way they live because they are experiencing the consequences of lifestyles in the wealthy, developed world. But we can learn from Malawi and other countries already taking action to mitigate the impact of climate change. And we can look to our own lifestyles and choose to live more simply. There is hope for us and for our planet, but we need to act. In our declaration of a climate emergency made on Friday, we committed to telling the truth about the climate emergency and our part in it. <clears throat> to act by working with others to mitigate the impact of global heating and by seeking justice for all those already affected. As Christians, our hope is in striving for the kingdom of God, in turning our wills, our energy, our resources, to working for that day when God's kingdom comes on earth, for Janet and for the women of Malawi, for the families living in poverty in our country, for the species threatened with extinction, for our lovely, fragile planet home. Creator God, from the tree of the Garden of Eden to the tree in the city in Revelation, we thank you for your vision of creation healed. Help us to be your agents of restoration, tending to the beauty of the earth and enabling your healing of the nations. Amen. <clears throat>